Hello, my name is Matthias Maurer, and this is a presentation about perovskite solar cells integrated into a lightweight 3D printed drone. This project is by me, Matthias Maurer, with mentorship from Spencer Folk. Here's a bit of project background. Uh, it is presenting, I'm presenting from Castafels, Spain, about 20 minutes from Barcelona, and I'm interested in engineering and physics, as well as soccer and snowboarding. Uh, as you can see here, this is my mentor, Spencer Folk, who goes to UPenn. Um, and the reason I chose this subject is actually a bit about football. So in September 2023, uh, I was coming back from practice and I saw this big net and I thought maybe they were putting up a new building or a new soccer field, maybe. And eventually my curiosity got the best of me and I went to look and it turned out it was a drone testing facility. Um, so we got to control this drone with actually with the app on our phone. And I got to control a smaller drone inside with facial, ge facial gestures and our hands, which was very cool. Around this area, there was also another institute called the Institute of Photonic Sciences, which is where I was able to present this project about solar cells and the effect of wavelength on their current output. Um, and really, these two things are what brought together this uh, project because it brought the drone interest and the solar cells, or specifically perovskites, which are a type of solar cell. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about these three things. Uh, firstly, with the drones. So there are many drone innovations. As you can see here, the market for drones is increasing and fixed wing is becoming a larger part of it, around 40%. Um, and here are four of the key innovations in drone technology. Firstly, AI uh, taking a part in power management, making drones more efficient. Um, also structures such as these planes, which uh, help increase um, lift and reduce drag. And also these batteries. So, um, for example, lithium potassium batteries become more stable and more efficient as well as the batteries are becoming um, in, input into the structure um, so that it actually just the, the wings of the plane are actually just the, the battery, um, which is very cool. And then also lighter materials such as graphene on this uh, graphene covered drone are making them lighter weight and lasting more distances in the air. Um, another example of drones are high altitude pseudo satellites or HAPs, which, out, which uh, operate at very, very um, high altitudes and are able to do um, environmental um, readings and um, experiments. And an example of this is a Zephyr. It's a Zephyr, which weighs 75 kilograms. And as you can see, it's very large and weighs only 75 kilograms, which is less than some people. And it is launched by hand. And it is able to stay aloft for 64 days at 60,000 um, feet in the air, which is double the, the altitude of commercial airplanes. Um, and it does this only through solar solar power, which is absolutely impressive. Um, and concluding this uh, drone uh, part of the, the presentation, I'd like to now talk, talk about perovskite research and innovations. And here's a normal perovskite cell. Uh, it's got its cathode and anode. It looks quite like a, a silicon cell. And there in the middle in the red, you can see the perovskite. Um, but really to um, understand this, we have to go back and understand um, wavelength of light and how light is composed of different colors. And so we know that um, you, when there's rain or, or sunlight, you can see uh, rainbows. And this is the um, white light dispersing into um, the different colors or its wavelengths. And here we can see the wavelengths of light coming to white light and then expanding back into its original colors, um, which is very interesting to see. And this leads into how silicon cells best absorb wavelengths of light of 1,100 nanometers. And perovskites best absorb wavelengths of light of 850 nanometers, which is much closer to the visible light part of the electronic electromagnetic spectrum. And so I guess you can see there's a large difference between the wavelengths of light that the two cells absorb. Um, and you're probably thinking what we're all thinking, which is what if you put the two together? And that's exactly what they do in tandem or multi-junction solar cells. They put perovskite and solar silicon or different uh, materials together. And they're able to absorb both the 1,100 nanometers and the um, 850 nanometers of wavelength, um, which obviously increases the efficiency. And here in this on the red on the top right, you can see that um, some researchers have been able to exceed the Shockley quasar limit and reach 34.6 percentage um, efficiency, which is very impressive. And even in the Institute of uh, Solar Energy Systems in 2022, um, they reach with a four junction cell, 47%, which is very incredible um, and, and interesting to see. So concluding with the efficiency part of perovskite and solar cells, I'd like now to move on to the thickness of perovskite cells. Um, and as you can see in this drone right here, this is a very interesting study that has been done at um, the Austria's Johannes Kepler University of Linz. 
um, where they have created these perovskite solar cells, which are 20 times thinner than hair. They are only 2.5 micrometers thick, making them quasi 2D, which means they're almost two dimensional. That's how thin they are. And this means that they reduce the weight incredibly. And um, they do this with an efficiency of 20%, which is incredible for how thin they are. And in addition to this, they're also flexible, which means that you can use this perovskite to cover parts of your drone or, or surfaces that you wouldn't normally be able to cover, uh, for example, if they were um, circular or a different shape that wasn't completely flat. So these three advantages of perovskite um, are why it's mainly relevant in our investigation to drones. So it's low weight, it's flexible, and it's efficiency. So moving on to the investigation, or what I've called the innovation section, because um, this perovskite, as you can imagine, I'm going to combine the perovskite and the drone. A perovskite fixed-wing drone, there have been a perovskite rotary-wing drone that has been produced, as you see, in the Kepler study. But from what our uh, research suggests, there really we haven't found any perovskite fixed-wing drone. And we really want to be innovative and do something that was, that was new. Um, so it was difficult, but we tried to show that it would be possible. And uh, so, as you can see, the background research yields uh, no perovskite gliders. Um, and reviewing the calculations of the perovskite cells that we had and our 3D printed drone, um, we we realized that we actually probably wouldn't be able to get um, sustained flight, but we would actually only get a small measurable difference of thrust from the solar cells that shows that these solar cells will actually improve the distance very slightly, but we would then be able to extrapolate this um, with a covering of more efficient cells and thinner and less weight, that it would be possible. So how do we do this? Well, we had to borrow a 3D printer. We had to print some parts. Here's some part of the plane. We then had to fix the 3D printer as it was quite prone to some malfunctioning and, and we had to fix many parts of it. But then we did get our 3D, our, uh, 3D printed glider, as you can see here, without the solar cells on it. And it looks very nice. And so the next section was uh, obviously to make perovskite solar cells. And here we tried to make two for the first time, and it did not work out very well. As you can see, the lead halide uh, solution crystallized on the perovskite because it oxidized with um, the oxygen in the air. Um, and this happened uh, because we didn't exactly use the right um, techniques to, to make it happen. Um, because you have to heat this up to 400 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, which is not something you can do in your household oven. Uh, you need specified equipment. And we also learned about annealing, which was the process of heating up these perovskites. So we did finally get the perovskite cells made, and they did work, as you can see in this video here, where the propeller is spinning. It is spinning a lot slower, I mean, a lot faster in real life, as the frame rate of the camera is matching the revolutions per second of the propeller. But it is spinning a lot faster, which is interesting to see. And then we have the solar cells on the wings. They do look small and not very aerodynamic, um, but they but they did work very well. So, so that is good to see. And naturally, to make sure this experiment was as scientifically appropriate, we had to try and control all the variables of our flight. So we did this by trying to control the speed at which we launched the drone and control the direction and angle that we launched the drone. And we did this by creating this channel with a trolley on top and a pulley system with a weight that would essentially launch the plane every time with the same exact force. And how did this go? Well, <coughs> well, as you can see, como esta in Spanish uh, isn't anything good. Uh, it didn't work very well. We had some pieces break and well, we abandoned both this launching mechanism and the hard surface landing area. We had to fix some, some pieces. We fixed the aileron. We added some more solar cells. Um, we lowered the weight in the front a bit and it might not look like it, but this is our success here. So as you can hear at the end, I say, I don't think anything broke, um, which is funny, but it's it's really crucial to why we consider this a success, because we were able to find a place where we could throw the drone and measure the increase in distance without it breaking, so we could have enough trials to show these the increase in the, the actual measurable difference that these solar cells created. Um, and here we were measuring the thrust of the solar cells and the distance that we were to fly it. 
And this led to these graphs here, the thrust produced by the number of solar cells, which as you can see, as we increased our solar cells, our thrust in grams of the propeller increased. And also the distance traveled by the drone with and without the motor um, was very slightly, but it was greater with the motor, with the solar cells, which means that our propagate solar cells, as we expected at the beginning, would prove to be just a tiny bit better when they were on and they were able to produce that extra thrust than when they were off. And we thought we could extrapolate this into a solar only glider using Provsky, and we want to see if this is possible. So based on similar drone specifications, the motor needed to achieve flight would require 7.4 volts with 6.3 amps of maximum. And assuming a flight thrust setting of 50%, which is standard for RC drones, this gives a flight power needed of 23 watts. So we needed 23 watts to be able to fly our drone. And we also knew that a glider with a quasi 2D Provsky would be around 300 grams. So when ours was 300 grams, but if we we're able to cover the entire wings with thinner and less and lighter weight provskite. We imagine it would be probably around the same weight, which is 300 grams. And that weight would need around 30 watts of power to fly. So at 25% efficiency, each centimeter squared would generate 25 milliwatts. And multiplying that by the 1,263 square centimeters of usable wing space that we had on just the wings of our plane, we could generate 31.6 watts, which is just enough for sustainable flight. And our results in conclusion, we believe that um, this 3D print printed glider with fabricated organic propagate solar cells, it did show its expected small increases in thrust. <clears throat> but these calculations also showed that it could be um, used for sustainable flight. And these innovations in drone design and materials combined with the propagate solar cell advancements could bring sustainable flight to a broader range of drones and uses. And here's an example of this. As you can see, perovskite uh, solar cell is going to, is projected to increase to an, an incredible amount of 2.4, of 2,479 million US dollars. And there are multiple uses of this, for example, in cars to extend their, their, their range of, of driving or in drones, as you can see in this NASA built one here. Or even in space, uh, a recent study came back showing that Perovskite in space actually was able to self-repair itself and become more efficient when there was no gravity, which is very interesting. And these are incredible implications of Perovskite and Perovskite drones, as you can see in the bottom left, um, in, in real life. So that's the next step for Perovskite and our idea. But for this project, we wanted to take it in the next step and bring it to the Perovskite solar cells and optoelectronics uh, conference where we were accepted to present our idea. And while presenting this this poster, we wanted to see if anyone there would be able to lend us some provskite that we would be able to cover our wings with and show if it really was possible to have sustainable flight. And here are some works references if you're interested in reading any of them. And I would like to have a huge thanks to Alex Servant uh, from Case Western Reserve University in USA for some of the aerodynamics and the engineering to Christoph Putz from Kepler University, which did the quasi 2D drone from Austria for helping with some guidance on the drone. From Valentina Gacha and ICFA, who helped us build the, make the Provskite cells. And finally, Spencer Folk and Polygence for making this possible and having so much mentorship in this project. Thank you very much.